and it's getting ready to start any second. There it goes. Okay. Nice. So we're talking about how our APIs are set up and something useful here. So Easton, you're also working on another application and all of our applications have a similar API setup. So the, the mechanics of it are about the same. So I'm sharing a screen right now and let's take a look here. Okay, we are in the routes path. Now, some of our applications don't necessarily have a directory for routes, but let's take a look. So, routes.home would be considered the top level thing. And when you start a Luminous application, last I checked, it has only one directory for routes, and it's something like this. So, it, it, I think they have a couple other things now, but the routes themselves are only in one place. So, okay. We're going to use this fire up dered here and look at the directory structure. All right, so here is our routes directory. All right, so you can see what we've got in here. We've got our admin routes, our DB, our DB routes, our various things. Home is the entry point. And if we look at our DB routes, what's in here? Make it smaller so we can just see. Okay, so we've got several CRUD things, and so the D routes are intended to be the CRUD API. Now, um, in terms of modeling an application this way, and, and by the way, so this particular thing, so having the DB routes, I believe is the only application we have that does it this way. And I think that the the Nathan and the developers they built it this way so that it makes makes it easier to write, so we know where to put things. On the flip side, it's, it's a little more verbose. And so I'm not sure this is my favorite way to do it, but this is the way this application does it. All right. So next we'll look at how the, the entry point works. So here we've got our home. All right. So we've got some things that aren't used. So, so ServeMD is not used anymore because we don't use MD files. But let's look at homepage. So a lot of things use this function right here. And if you read this, this is a very small function, right? All it does is call another function of the namespace and pass it the username. And you'll note that right here, if you remember last week's destructuring, um, how is this work? What kind of a data structure is coming to this function that this destructuring makes sense? Vector. It, yeah, it's going to be a vector or, or a list or something sequential. So it's going to be a sequential thing, not a map that's coming in. And we're going to have the username if there is a thing. So maybe you don't know this, but when you have ampersand, that means optional args, right? So mm -hmm. ampersand means optional. And then whenever you have ampersand, it's going to pass all the optional args. So you might have other stuff before. So you might have actual required args and then the rest are optional, right? Now, all the rest, anything after the ampersand is going to come in as a list. It's going to get wrapped up for you and given to you. So if you want the first thing in that list, you don't want the whole list, then you have the, uh, the, the right there. So you have the, the destructuring saying, okay, I've got a list and I'm going to, hang on, I'm going to take that first thing for destructuring. So. Just a moment here. All right. Mm -hmm. And if I'm unlucky, I may have just frozen. Nope. Okay. Good, good. All right. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the function takes the list and takes the username. All right, and let's undo here because oh, too many undos. Okay. And by the way, I mentioned this issue though, but you can tell that I'm now back to the clean state of the buffer because if you look down at the mode line, it's just all dashes. If there were stars yeah. down here by the DOS, if there were stars, that means there's a change. This is a modified file. But it's all dashes, yeah. which means we're in the clean state according to the latest save. Any changes have been saved. So, okay. All right. So it's going to call, once again, so the homepage is calling something in our layout namespace that we've called. 
pick up render sil js base and pass in the username. And remember, we're passing username, but it's optional up here, which means that this function needs to be ready to get past nil. Because if there's no username, it's getting nil. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a quick look at this function here. All right, here we are in the other namespace. Hiccup render sil.js base. Now, um, have either of you gathered what hiccup is? I, I hope so. Who wants to explain? What, what is hiccup? Man, maybe not. Okay, let me explain. Okay, so hiccup is Clojure's way of generating HTML. And hiccup itself is a library, but now we just call this syntax of vectors and maps to, to generate HTML, hiccup. And so on the front end, technically it's not hiccup because hiccup is a back end library, but it's pretty much hiccup because you're still using vectors and maps and it's based on hiccup. They say we're based on hiccup or we're writing in hiccup. You just say that all the time. So hiccup is the way of doing it. So the other way you could build an app is say, I've got a template file, something template.html or something. And I'm going to stick the results of code into that file. And if you've done web development in other languages, that, that's a pretty common idiom also. Um, so there are actually a lot of Clojure developers who prefer to do it that way. So they'll say, I've got an actual HTML file, and then it's got like almost like PHP style stuff in there where when the server gets a hold of it, it's going to supplement that file. Um, that's not the way we do it. We, the way we do it is just pure data structures and it's all in Clojure. So there's no HTML until you're the receiver, until you're the recipient. All right, but here we are. Okay, so we're going to give it a content type wrapping and it's gonna be an okay. So content type is gonna be okay, meaning we're going to wrap it up and say it's gonna have a 200 code. So it's gonna come through as a code 200 HTTP thing. And then it's gonna have the HTML5 headers. So that means like, you know, um, what HTML version are you on, HTML inside the brackets, all the, all the stuff here. And then it's going to do all these functions inside of it. So this is, by the way, this is a macro, HTML5 is. And the reason HTML5 is a macro, and you can tell, is because in general, you know that functions in Clojure always return the last thing in them, right? Yeah. Macros are used to rewrite code. And so in this case, they said, you know, I'd really like it if in this case, I can stick all this stuff in and all of it's gonna build up the result. So normal closure syntax doesn't really let you do that, so they wrote a macro to do it. So it makes sense. So we're gonna add the boiler header, the boiler plate, the anti-forgery element, and so and then the CLJS app stuff to make the actual application front end connect here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's hang on just a second here. If I I guess I need to give it a username, so I'll go. So I've def that in this name thing. And the reason I've def that is so that I can now evaluate this function and see what it does. So we're gonna evaluate control C, control P, and we get it over here. Here's the output. It's, first off, uh, what, what kind of, what is this? What's the data type? A string? Yep, it's just a string. Now, if you know your strings, now what is it? What, what kind of a string is it? HTML. Yep, this is just, just HTML, just HTML. And so this is what the browser is going to get. In fact, when you visit the application in the front end, this is what the browser does get. So this is all the stuff you can see. Oh, anti-forgery element is unbound for various reasons. Um, that doesn't really matter right here, but okay. And then we've got all these things. We've got the anti-forgery token and then we've got our dependencies. So these are all things that got added by this stuff over here, boiler header, boiler plate, CLJS app header, and so on. The thing we care the most about is the CLJS app base and the app includes. So if we look here, right here, you can see, oh, that took me too much stuff because it's just a string. Okay, this string right here, that's our app, that's our front end app right there. So it gets put into app.js and that's what the closure script compiles down to, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a, the beating heart of the front end application. This is what gives us a front end. 
And if ever you want to add a dependency, like add a new CSS file, or you're using a third party JavaScript library, it's in this namespace where you add that because you need it to be added to this output you're seeing right here. So, so that's, that's what this is. Okay. Any, any questions about how that works? All right, so this is the main thing. And now I'm gonna do alt comma to go back to where I came from with my alt dot earlier. And you can see that that's cider pop back is the command on the right there. Okay, all right. Now remember that one function, it takes all that, uh, does that thing. And the reason I highlighted that one function is because we use that for a lot of things. So, okay, now we have home paths, all right? I know we haven't quite gotten to Easton's real question yet, but this is the, the core of how the API works here, or of actually how the routing works overall. So mm -hmm. we're, first off, we are home paths. We call it underscore home paths because this is a utility definition. It's not something anybody in any of the namespace should be using. Technically, we should make it private probably, but not bothered here. It's just a vector of strings. And you see all the stuff here. These are all the routes that should be available in this application. Now, what do you think we're going to be doing with a vector of these strings? What, why do you think this might be handy? Probably just searching through it. We're going to construct something out of all of these strings. And one of the core things is, so all of these in, in a traditional server application, uh, SPA, then I'm sorry, that's single page application in an SSR server side rendering. These would all be HTML files on the server that when they get called from the server, it gives you the HTML file. That is not how we're running things in our single page application. Now, some people in the community say, well, you ought to make both. You ought to make something that works as a single page and as a server side. And there's some good reasons for that, but it's also a lot of extra work, so we haven't done that. Okay, so we've just got a bunch of strings, and some of them have comments on them. Okay, now we're going to use that data structure in this next function. Okay, so mm -hmm. here we go in home routes. It takes no args, and it's going to stick our results into a vector. And keep in mind, so we're doing data-driven development here, meaning that we, we operate our entire structure instead of control structures and complicated if statements and conditionals. Instead, we just do as much as we can with things like vectors and maps. We say, just give us these generic things and we'll guide the program based on those as much as we can. Okay, so we're going to create a certain type of vector here that has a middleware map in it. And you'll notice that these are both part of the into. So, this is what we're starting with, a blank string, and then a comment on middleware. And then we're gonna go through our home paths. Here's our for loop, very simple here. We're gonna go through it for each one of those strings. We say, put a vector in, where the first thing is whatever string we got. And the second thing is a map that says, get home page. Now, here's where I'll talk about the library now. So the power of our the thing that's powering our routing is called uh, Readit. So Readit is a very cool library. So in the past, we you've used things, and I think the older versions of Luminous also use things like um, oh man, I just forgot the word. Started with C L and it has a J, which doesn't help much. Okay, so it's it's a it's a oh composure. In the past, we've used Composure, which is one of the oldest, most rock solid, famous ways of doing APIs, but it's com it's completely powered by macros, which means that your editor has a little bit of a hard time with it and it plays by some of its own rules because macros let you make your own rules. And that's not always nice for the community. So Reedit is totally data driven. So you have vectors and maps that do things. And so I'm gonna have a vector with a string that says, here's the path and then a map that says, what do I do when this path gets this kind of a request? So here we're talking about the home routes. All the home routes do the same exact thing. That's why this function is possible. 
That's why we only needed a vector of all of those strings. Because from that, we can make something that is the same thing for every route. We're going to stick a string in here. So each one of those strings, and whatever they do, if they get it with the browser, which means that's the normal thing a browser does, is get. If they, go to, if they get any of those pages, it's going to call that same backend layout function we saw with the hiccup and give them that. And the front end can worry about, now what do I do? Now I know that I'm at page XYZ. When I see XYZ, what do I do? And the front end decides, oh, now I render such and such a view. But the back end is exactly the same for all of those. All right. So that's how we build the majority of our routes. In fact, let's take a quick look here. So if these are our routes, All right. No, that's not the one I want. Anyway, so we've got, oh, it looks like 25 or so routes here that are all doing on the back end the exact same thing because the front end is handling the view. Okay. So we're, we're getting closer to your question, Easton. Getting closer. All right. So as a quick review, so say you want to add a new page. So Shiza, maybe you're adding... Um, you, you've just added a new page for one of the one of the routes, right? You just added a new page in the workflow. And so suppose you want to add a, a new page somewhere. How do you do it from what we've seen already? How do you make the app have a new page? Um, I'm not sure at this point. Okay, so the way we do it is, well, first off, we have to ask, okay, is this new page something the front end is going to do? And most of them, the answer is yes, so we'll just assume yes. And so all we do is add that path right in here. So I'm gonna say slash new page. And as of now, it's the back end is ready to respond to anybody who tries to go to slash new page with giving it to the front end. And the front end needs to decide what to do there. But as far as the back end goes, that's it. That's all. Um, wait, have we created the new page though? Because that's just routing the page. Yeah, that, that's that's routing. And that's today is what we're talking about. But if we want to, next time we can talk about creating the actual page. So yeah, I guess my question was a little bit unhelpful because I didn't I didn't really express that. But yeah, just the routing. So Okay, sorry. So that's that's how we do the routing there. All right. So the home route is going to go through all of those and generate a big old vector of vectors with one map here at the top. And all those vectors are going to be homogeneous, like exactly the same. So, okay. We've got a few helper things here. Some more helper stuff. Okay, and then we have other routes here as well. These ones are intended to handle the actual files. And so one of the things to see here is these routes are not in the above because they're not going to be all handed to the front end. These are not front end routes. So we've got audio and we follow the standard CRUD HTTP convention. So create, read, update, delete. Read is get. So that's what a browser does. And so if I'm just trying to read an audio file, then I just do get. Now, in the world of web apps, usually that's not authenticated or it's not, it's not expected to be authenticated as much as other types of requests, but for right now, we're fine with that. Same thing here. Just read these, just get me a file. That's all, that's all I want, just get. You just read operations. But then on the namespaces, let's, uh, let's hop to the DB routes. Let's say users, for instance, okay. There are several things in here. Let's see if at the bottom do we have routes. We don't. Okay, these must be the helpers. So probably it's in here. Okay. All right. Here we have the actual database routes. And this is closer to what you used to mention. This is where you're actually doing kind of an API. All right. And here we have different mod methods. So we have just the just the get, and that's also indicating their name. So they only respond to the get. 
Um, come on, guys. I hope you wrote some here that use. Okay, there's a post. So, and that makes sense because when you're registering, you're creating a new thing. You're making a new user. So, there's a post there, and when it gets a post, it's going to do is when it gets a get, it's going to give a 404. There is no get on this route, but there's a post right here, and it's going to give it to that function. And let's take a quick look at that function. Okay, you can see that there's whenever you're doing this kind of routing, there's heavy destructuring because automatically it's going to get past the request, which is a map, and then you do stuff with it. So here we go. We've got the map. We get all the information out of it that we expect for our for our uh, registration, and all the magic happens. Okay. <coughs> all right. And so you can have any you get post delete you can have update patch whatever you want those methods can all be things on this map right here so i can have a post and a get and many times i actually favor the applications that do it that way so we don't have like a slash create registration route which is only going to be a post we have a slash registration and if you post i'm going to create if you delete to it, then I'm going to delete something, and so on. Does that make sense? Any any questions there, Easton? I don't think so. Okay. How about you, Shiza? Yeah. yeah. I understand. Okay. All right. So here are the non-homogenous routes. So the ones that are not all the same, not all just giving to the front end. And you can see how those work here. All right. So... The next, this is how you build the routes, but I think your question was a little more than that, right? Yeah, well, yeah, it was just how to, like, make the request. Yeah. Okay, so from our front end. Yeah. All right. So, by the way, I just did the, the one we mentioned to you earlier, which is uh, the control to P, and you can see that in the, in the key log on the right there, control alt O, opens up the hydro window. I did P for projectile. Now I'm choosing a file. Um, it's going to be one of our front ends. I'm going to say CLJS. And let's take a look at somebody who does one. Let's see. Does anybody do a front end request? All right. Where are you working at, Easton? Which, uh, which file? Namespace. Well, I, I guess, I mean, one you could be using is, like, the add recipient. When you hit add, it could, like, make a post request for the back end. Okay. That's not what I'm modifying, but I'm not, I, I, where I need to know how to do this is on hum help, so I figure we'll just uh, pick that one. All right. So, as an example, here we go. And the dependencies that are going to be relevant here are reframe.core is the main one. Okay. So first off, keep in mind, all the stuff that we looked at a second ago, that needs to be in place to, to answer any call you're going to make. So you've got to have a backend that's ready for whatever request you want, right? Are you still there, Easton? Yeah. I think your video froze on me. Okay. All right. I'm trying to decide if you were really bored or if you were just <laughs> frozen. Okay. Uh -oh. So this is the pattern we usually follow here. So you'll usually see this. As always, we've got our let to set up the state before our application. And it has a couple of benefits as well. We are going to build our information. So in this case... We've got our front end database is going to get a subscription to the place where we're storing all the info and the stuff we need to do paging on a display. Okay. Now, when you're making a request on the front end, you need your params. That's going to be an argument to your request. So in this case, my params are going to include these two keywords. And one of them is, a, well, actually, they're both maps. Okay. And then we have a URI. This is going to be my first argument, usually. So the URI is going to say, where am I making the request to? 
and then I put it all together in a map here. So it needs, so at this point, so this map has to have the structure. This is not an ad hoc map. This is one the APIs expect. Okay, so we've got the URI, where are we going? How are we going? In this case, we're posting. If it comes back as a success, what do we do? This is a vector. So this is in reframe structure here. So this is okay. a vector where the first thing is the reframe keyword of the event that I should be going to with my successful response. Now, whatever I say here, so set recipients Can you list. That again, Tori. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, which part? On success so, came back? Yeah, the first argument that you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. So this is a reframe syntax here. So this is a reframe event. There's going to be a reframe event called set recipients list, and we can look at that in a second. And on the whenever you have an on success KVEC, it's going to attach the response as a second argument to this vector right here. So we don't see it here, but when it comes back, it's going to get stuck in here and passed to set recipients list is going to get that second argument. Okay. Whatever the results were. So in this case, it's a new recipient map. It's probably going to send us back maybe something including their ID number and other stuff maybe. So that's uh, what it's going to have what's going to be sent to this function when it's successful. Now there's also, I believe an on error KVEC, which is not on this map. So there's no error handling happening here, mm. but you could say if I get something that's not a 200 back, hand it to this other function. And I think we probably have a default for that. So if we don't give you an on error KVEC, then the function we're going to call or the event rather, is going to do that for us. And finally, we have params. And this again, this is a required thing where we say, hey, here's the information I'm sending along with my request. So remember that here we are adding a new recipient. Okay, so we're going to need paging information for some reason and recipient map. So that's going to be, here's how you're gonna create the guy in the database or whatever, right? So when you're making your request, how do you know what needs to be in the params? So that's a good question. Um, it involves knowing the back end. So the back end we just looked at, you should know, okay, so the route I'm trying to call is dealing with, is going to respond by calling this particular function, which mm -hmm. wants some kind of args. That's the one you have to make happy. And especially if you're, you might be writing that function yourself. And so you decide what, what args you want. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to look through. I guess I was just kind of lost when I was looking through the back end, trying to figure out what arguments were required. I don't know. It was just hard to follow. Where okay, I yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very fair critique. Absolutely. And we should probably do a better job of, of giving some documentation here. But let's, at, right at this point, let's uh, follow this through. So we'll see how we could try and answer that question. Uh -huh. All right. So I'm going to make this call here. And it's gonna happen first off with a dispatch sync. So um, have both of you done any of the reading on reframe yet, the way it works? Started. <laughs> okay. So essentially it's what's called in some of the uh, information system classes or maybe in the web dev class in CS, a pub sub system, publication subscription. So pub sub systems means that it's going to be responsive to receiving changes to subscriptions it has or publishing to make changes to things that might have subscriptions somewhere else. So in this case, the way you publish, so the pub part is via uh, reframe slash dispatch. Now dispatch sync says reframe, don't do any of your caching magic. Don't do any of the stuff you do to make things smooth most of the time. This time I want my answer as soon as possible. Just, just, Forget any of the helpers, just give me the answer immediately. And so I want the things on screen to change ASAP. And so that's what dispatch sync does as opposed to just plain old dispatch. Okay, and the thing we're dispatching to is that same syntax I mentioned earlier. The first thing is a keyword that is the name of the thing, kind of like calling a function. And then the argument we've constructed, our PMAP from up above. All right. Now we're going to go look. Okay, so we can either look at the handler with HTTP 
or the reset ad recipient. Now this one is just going to be calling a refresh. You notice it has no arguments. So this is going to be doing something that's not tied to this function. Okay. Now, where do we find these things? So where did we put, so handle with HTTP, that's ours. And both of these are ours. So we made these, where are they? Do either of you know yet from the code base? So I know there's like a subs file, but I don't, I think that's for subscriptions though. Is that the same as, does it also have the sync, the dispatches? The dispatches are oh, going to yeah. be here in events. Yeah, and that, that's the word that um, Reframe uses for them. So events. So in, in, in principle, subs is where things that are going to be reading are at. Events are where things that are going to be um, events, changing things are at. And I forgot the name of what we're looking for, handler with HTTP. Here it is. Here's the structure of, of this reframe thing, okay? So it starts, so at this point, I kind of need to apologize because it's almost like learning a new syntax. And it's not as good of a syntax, right? I, we like our def in, def in, a symbol, blah, blah. And this one is harder for editors to follow. Only the latest editors actually can follow these things. Because it's only a keyword here. But there's a special function here, reg event fx. That means it's going to do something like a backend call. And we're going to call it handler with HTTP. Remember, this is the name that matches that first thing in the vector we saw earlier. So this is how those work. They, they match each other. So the name of the thing is, think of it like a defin. It's like a defin. And then what is it? It's a function. And whenever you're doing FN, you don't have to name this, but it helps debuggers if you do, because you know where you're at a little better. And then we've got the args that this takes. Now this argument structure, this is particular to reframe again. The first thing given to any reframe thing is the reframe database. So if you need to base whatever you're doing on information you've already got, it's there. In this case, we started with an underscore, meaning we're not gonna use this. We know we're getting it, but we don't need it. So we're skipping it. And then we have a vector, okay? Let me um, pull open here where we just were so we can follow along here. All right, so here's our call right here, and then I'm going to now to just that. Okay, so let's look at this call here. All right, and we're gonna destructure this as we go here. All right, so Shiza, maybe you can follow along here. So I'm gonna ask you some questions as we step through the destructuring here. So first off, we have the underscore DB. That's not part of the call above. That just always comes in. And here, we, we don't need it, we don't want it. So we just are gonna skip it. The underscore means we don't care, but DB tells us what it is anyway, just so we know. All right, now here we go in a vector. What is this vector matching? The one that you're currently on? Yeah, because under the hood, remember how earlier we looked at optional arguments and I said they all come in as a list? Yeah. So basically this is considered an optional argument because you remember that we had some dispatch syncs up above that didn't have any args. That's because reframe builds things with optional arguments and so they come in as a list. Okay, so now we're in the rest of the stuff is what this vector here means. Okay. What do you think this underscore binds to? To the vector that's in the curly bracket? It actually binds to, so the vector, the, the square vector down in the registration uh, function, it binds to this vector here. So we said rest, it's gonna be here. So the underscore binds to this keyword, the name of the function. Now you need that name, well, reframe needs that name to know which thing we're calling. But now we don't care about that name anymore. So we made an underscore because we don't care. 
So will so, that underscore if you call the function would call the fu the same function that that that's binding. So yeah, it's, right here it's not even a function. It's just a plain old keyword. So this underscore, if you if we said somewhere down here we said print the underscore, it's going to print handler with HTTP the keyword the keyword of that. Well, we we don't need that anymore. Reframe needed it to match up with what we're doing here, but we don't need it anymore. So it's just blank. Now we've got some more serious destructuring here. What's what's this? What's this gonna match? Either of you have an idea? It's just the pieces of PMAP. This yeah, this is matching PMAP. This is doing some this is getting some values out of PMAP. Although, what does the colon or do? I don't know if that's going to change. Oh, good, good. So, yeah, we did. So, remember last week we taught destructuring, and I think that um, I forgot to ask Scott to mention this. So, or is how you give default values oh, okay. they're not there. So, I'm going to need a method, a keyword method in the PMAP. Oh, if, you don't, if you don't have it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it get. Okay. It's very, very handy, very useful. Okay. All right. So we've dug in. And so this this map here is our PMAP. And then we do the magic here. And I actually, I'm not sure how exactly Reframe does all of this. Let's uh, I'm gonna close that guy who don't need it anymore. All right. Reframe somehow one of the plugins to reframe says if your regevent FX returns a map that is HTTP XH Rio, it's going to be an AJAX request. So if you know your if you know a little bit of web dev, um, XH Rio or XHR is part of the syntax for how requests happen. So it's going to make a request. How? Well, either get or whatever you told me, which in our case, we looked earlier and it was actually post. To what URI, the URI you gave me, with what params, the params you gave me. And remember, this is closure. So if our params included like URI and stuff in them, it doesn't actually matter here because it only uses the ones it needs. So you can't, you can't add bad things to a map. All you can do is leave things out. Because if it's, if it's a bad thing, then it just won't look at it. We'll ignore it. Okay. Um, timeout. So this is all stuff here for the AJAX request, the timeout, um, the format. So whenever you're making, if you look at the headers in your browser, it has a format that says, the thing I'm sending is this format. So we're saying that it's, a, it's JSON. So we're sending JSON. And then the headers also include, I expect you to give me back what? JSON. And in this case, our JSON helper can take an R here. That means, and just be nice to us. Don't give us strings as the head, as the names of all the stuff. Give us a proper map with keywords. So that's all that means. And here we go. Here's the on success KVEC. Um, Shiza, do you remember, what do you remember about this? Where did this come from? Which one? On success KVEC. Was it, it was, is, is it coming from, like it's right below that, but is it still attached to PMAP? It, it was, yeah. Yeah, we got it from, remember that when we when we made this call, we have a place where we say on Zuckus KVEC. So if it comes back with the 200, meaning success, here's what we're going to do. And this function says, I'm not deciding that, you're deciding that. You you gave me on Zuckus KVEC. So whatever you say we're doing. On failure, this function actually says, um, I've got my own thing. I'm just going to do this ref, uh, reframe thing. I'm going to do the on failure thing. So you never told me about this because I just always do the same thing for failures. All right. So that is the whole bit of how the entire process of the Ajax happens. Let's go look at on failure. Okay. So here you see the same, same buffer. 
we've got another event, which is on failure. And it gets validated, and it says, okay, just like everything else, so this is a recurring pattern, a, a pattern structure. We've got a function. After we got a keyword name of it. We happen, in this case, we have a validation function. And then we have the function that actually runs if validation works, which in this case, we're calling on failure. Now, remember the name of this function right here? It doesn't matter. You don't even need a name, actually. But the name helps with the debugger later, so it's just good practice. And it takes arguments. As always, that first argument is the DB. And this time, we did not put an underscore, which tells us that we actually we care about the DB now because we're going to be changing it. This is a reg event DB thing. Reg so event what DB. Does the, sorry. Um, so what ahead, is Jeff. the underscore inside the bracket? What does that bind to? Um, yeah, we'll sure. Just a second, just a second here. So reg event DB. So this is a reg event DB item, which means that it's going to change. It's going to make some change to your front end database, your reframe database. So if you haven't yet read the reframe documentation, I strongly encourage it because this will all make a lot more sense to you after reading that. So, okay. So we're going to take this database. We're going to make a change. Now we're getting args. The first arg is what? what? What's this underscore again? The keyword. Which in this case is what? Um, I guess it would be on failure. Exactly. Exactly. So on failure, we, we don't care about that. And the actual result, the thing that failed. So, okay. And we're going to stick in the database under the API error result key, oh. that result. So if you're wondering, hey, why did I fail? Go look at your database and look up that key. Okay. So do these keys always match though? Because I know we have that um, whatever, I don't even know what it's called. But when you pull up uh, flats, you have that thing on the side. I think Scott set up that pops oh, up. Oh, yeah. That's uh, Reframe 10X. So is that the same thing as the app DB? Yes. Yeah. So I actually, I personally have never used Reframe 10X and I actually helped Shiza sort of turn it off the other day because <laughs> it may not have been handy for her. But Nathan thought it was very handy and other people love it. So it depends. You know, personally, I like to work through the command line. But if you like to use the GUI, then they can be handy. Yeah. You're just seeing the database. But so you could also, like, um, just in your REPL query the app DB and figure out what, what's wrong. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yep, that's a, you can either do a subscription, so you can just do your good old RFC slash subscribe, whichever keyword, and you'll see whatever keyword. Or if you want to, you can look at the entire database by just not a function, just calling the map. Um, Reframe.db slash app DB, I think. Uh -huh. It's just, is that's the map that is actually the database in your front end REPL. So, but in this case, if we did want to just subscribe to it, would it just be on failure would be the only thing we have to subscribe? Um, actually, no, you'd, well, yeah, 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 that's exactly right, yes, on failure, because that's the subscribable thing. Um, if you're looking, if you're digging in like a regular map, you're just digging in, then you go to API error result, because that's what on failure is doing. Okay. So, so either one of those ways will get you there. All right. So if I was gonna like, if I was actually looking at the browser, the thing that whatever that thing's called, I I would look under API error result and not under on failure. Yes. Okay. Yeah, on failure is the name of the event, but it's not an actual thing in the database. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The one thing I'll let's see. We've got no. We're out of time. Okay. So I'll stop here. All right. Any last questions before we go? Um, I have a few questions, but it's not related to this. Um, okay. Um, should I? I'll go ahead then. I'll stop the recording. Okay. If I can remember where that's at, I am presenting. I am recording. Um, I always forget this part. There it is. And stopping now.